it's, it's a rare rarity. Mm -hmm. uh, I will do the beach chair probably. So if I <coughs> so uh, usually it's a craft repair, but it's actually so a label repair um, is uh, something. I'm not a believer in the fact that if you have a label tear, it gives you pain. Largely, it might give you some instability, and that might need treating. But I mean, I can't think of that many people that I have done both on. And when I, I plan, if I'm planning it, I do a beach chair. I can do a local chair, beach chair. I can do a stabilisation beach chair. It's fine. But I'll, I'll explain. Anyway, I'll explain why. Should we move on? Um, so, um, so we spoke about set up an anaesthesia. <coughs> so, um, my, what am I talking about? Diagnostic routine, <laughs> arthroscopic, arthroscopic anatomy, and normal variants. So, we need to know what's normal before we start. Okay, before we start treating pathology, which we'll be doing at the end of the morning. So when once we've now positioned the patient, and everything's going to be, I think this is a right shoulder um, <coughs> beach chair position, all, this, all the slides here. Okay. So we do an examination under anaesthetic after we've done our WHO timeout. We examine the shoulder. Then we think about portal placement and marking, uh, if we haven't marked already, and you're absolutely right, George. The other reason to mark before when you put the ropes on is I remember when I started as a, uh, you know, a registrar and fellow that I would put the drapes on and I'd put them in and I realised actually the drapes were sitting where I wanted to put my incision sometimes. Um, incision, uh, insertion of your cannula, visualisation and variance. Okay, <clears throat> so when we examine somebody under anaesthetic, this is really quite important because when you're examining the clinic, you're looking at active and passive range and you might actually think that their passive range for example, I don't know, they've got zero degrees of external rotation actively and passively. You might think, well, they've got a frozen shoulder, perhaps. But when they're under general anaesthesia, because of the fact that their muscle tone disappears, then they might actually have a normal range. You compare it to the other side. Is there any practice, any hypomobility, so in any instability signs? Do they have a sulcus? Do they have anterior, posterior glide? And compare it to the other side. So positioning, we talked about that. That's one of uh, Zach Sill. I think he's a spine surgeon now, isn't he? Um, so um, here you go. This is a left shoulder. We spoke about lateral positioning. <coughs> the reason just I use lateral positioning for shoulder arthroscopy when I'm doing label repairs purely is because what I want to do is just make a bit more room. It makes my life easier. Okay, so so it's not the lateral. This bit here this uh, lateral sling takes away again the need for my assistant to be pulling on the arm, that's all. It, if you do both it makes it slightly more difficult to get your head around what you're looking at perhaps sometimes. Okay so there's markings, these are your standard arthroscopy portal, so your standard viewing portal you put in line with the glenoid face which is really two centimetres inferior and two centimetres medially to the lateral aspects on the posterior corner of the acromion. So what you're effectively doing is you're putting your viewing portal in line with the glenoid face. <coughs> and once you've done that, you can put portals anywhere. And the other thing I actually <coughs> learned while doing knee surgery <coughs> was if you're putting a portal in, you think your portal isn't quite right, put another one in. And it took me ages to work that out when I was struggling away at Harlow doing knee arthroscopy and I'd sort of put my portal for whatever I was doing in the wrong place and I'd keep struggling. Just take the portal out and make another one. Got, you know. um, so portal placements, uh, the standard ones that you would use for most things like a subchromium decompression plus minus a C joint decision would be posterior, lateral and an anterolateral portal. So your lateral portal goes into the subacromial space just beneath the acromion and your anterolateral portal goes into the, rota the rotator interval which is that <coughs> gap between subscapularis and supraspinatus, that triangular gap that we'll look at in a moment. So posterior, anterolateral and lateral portals. Um, do you need to use cannulas? <coughs> no, absolutely you don't. If you're doing a label stabilisation, the standard portals will be posterior and then two anterolateral portals. One portal you tend to put in line with the glenoid, and the other portal you need to put laterally so that you can fire your anchors into the glenoid face without them sliding off, generally speaking. Um, <clears throat> so, what do we need to cover? Well, when we do shoulder arthroscopy, even if you're expecting to do a rotator cuff repair or just a subchromium decompression, 
you need to do a diagnostic arthroscopy inside the shoulder to make sure there is no pathology in there that you, are, you have missed because the patient's turned up with shoulder pain and you're treating them with something else, but you miss something. Scans are not 100% sensitive. And the pathology that mainly doesn't get picked up or is spurious on an MRI, for example, is the long head of biceps. Lots of weird and wonderful things can be wrong with long head of biceps and it can look absolutely normal on an MRI. So you need to evaluate the biceps as well as everything else. So these are the things that we're going to look at. <coughs> the rotator interval, where the superior <coughs> linear ligament is, subscapularis and its attachments, the biceps and its pulley, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, inferior recess, humeral head and the bare area, glenoid, labrum, subacromial space. And you just go through that in a sequential manner um, when you do your arthroscopy. So <coughs> what we're going to do. So this is the rotator interval. So this is the humeral head. So this is a left shoulder, okay? Left shoulder, humeral head, glenoid is here. This is <coughs> subscapularis, okay? This is the this is actually a cord-like um, middle glenohumeral ligament. This is the leading edge of the uh, uh, <coughs> That is subscapularis. So subscapularis is coming across, attaching to the less tuberosity on the left hand side. This is the biceps tendon and the superior clean humeral ligament. And this is what we describe as the pulley tissue to keep the long head biceps stable. This is the intra-articular portion of the long head biceps. This is the leading edge of supraspinatus and its attachment. The <coughs> rotator cuff should attach within one millimeter of the articular surface of the humeral head. If it extends, if its attachment is beyond that, then that would suggest that there is a articular surface tear of a tendon like supraspinatus. That supraspinatus tendon moving further back, this is the infraspinatus tendon, now we're looking at the back of the humeral head, that is the inferior recess, this is the attachment of the inferior glen humeral ligaments, so if you have a, uh, a haggle humeral avulsion of the glen humeral ligament, this <coughs> would have fallen away from the humerus and away from the articular margin humeral head articular surface, um, you can rotate the humeral head so that you can look at all portions of the articular surface, the posterior inferior glenoid labrum, and then the recess posteriorly, superior attachment of the biceps, the anterior part of the glenoid labrum, anterior inferior, and then the subacromial space, and we're actually inside the bursa there. You can also, if you've got portals, let's say you've got three portals, you don't always have to look from the back. <coughs> you can put the camera in at the front or the side. So quite often, I don't know if you come to theatre with me, I will be moving the camera front, back, so you get perspective of what you're actually looking at. So if you're looking at something at the back of the subacromial space, it might be easier to have the camera in at the front. Um, importantly, this is a dynamic test as well, so you want to probe all these structures that we've looked at and drag the long head of biceps into the joint so that you can visualize the pathology in the long head of biceps which will quite often exist in the extra articular portion of it. So if there is a split or a tear or a fray, or, it's quite often actually outside the joint. So, diagnostic arthroscopy. So again, left shoulder, so we're going into the rotator interval. We're looking at the long head of biceps, the pulley tissue, subscapularis. If you have a subscapular tear, often it will tear at the top first and then extend inferiorly. If that's the case, then the pulley tissue that stabilizes, <coughs> so this is the superior cable of sup uh, subscapularis, which is the thick bit of the subscapular tendon. If you tear that, this by definition also gets damaged and therefore if you're repairing the subscapular tendon, you must do something with the biceps because it's going to be running over your repair. So what we would usually do is either tenotomize it or do a tenodesis where you release it from outside, inside the joint, <coughs> on the outside of the joint. We're now looking down the intertubercular groove where the long head of biceps is running, but I haven't managed to drag the biceps into the joint. This is supraspinatus, a normal attachment, which is periarticular. Um, when I say I, actually, this is Adrian doing this. 
that's where it's hard. That's where it's hard. It looks slick, I was wondering. <laughs> It's a bit slow, that's yeah. why. <laughs> 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 um, it's terrible. Infraspinatus attachment, what's this, anybody? Uh, bearer. Uh, yes. <clears throat> so, bearer has often got pits in it, and actually you can, um, you can always infuse a, a patient by sort of like focusing on the capillaries, and you can see the core clusters <coughs> using, using the the scope, you can actually focus on, you can see <coughs> the circular red blood cells, so actually the definition on the, the scope is a pretty phenomenal. This is inferior glenial humeral ligament attachment, inferior recess on only loose body, <coughs> inferior part of the glenoid, the labour, and then we're going to look at the posterior aspect in a moment of the glenoid, and then there's a, generally there's a, a reasonable <coughs> size recess posterior to that, and then the superior glenial <coughs> humeral uh, Sorry, labral attachment of biceps and then the antro inferior aspect of the, the labrum. So, if you have anterior instability, a labral bank heart will involve generally anything between three and six o'clock. Okay, um, it's a little bit degenerate and it's perhaps a bit meniscoid, but that's <coughs> normal. This is a normal shoulder. Okay, so that's. 100% normal, and there is a cord like middle glenial humeral ligament. Okay, so now the only bit that we're adding here is pushing a portal. <coughs> so our portal is going to be in the rotator interval anterolaterally. I tend to use my like Adrian has a needle here to judge my line of attack, and then you can use a blade um, and then incise the capsule and then put your probe in. Obviously the important thing is if you're using a blade, you would be careful that you're not damaging the elongated biceps or subscapularis. Put your probe in and then you probe all these structures. Um, we're going to whiz through that slightly quicker. <coughs> so we're probing that and then this is the uh, important probe. Soup there is a reasonable degree of um, Variability. The superior labral attachment here is 100% attached and perhaps posterior dominant. If you look anteriorly, there is a deficiency. That's pretty normal. Um, we'll talk about the variance in a moment and then dragging the long head of biceps into the joint and looking down at its intra -arch no, its extra articular portion is an important thing. <coughs> Drag that down and then we want to look at really the five centimetres or so if we can. You see. There is a bit of synovitis and biceps there, um, but uh, was in the, the rounds normality. There's no split and there's no tear. Okay, so normal <coughs> variants. So the individual that we just looked at, a type one superior labral attachment, so it's posterior dominance, um, and then these are that's balanced, that's balanced, and that's posterior deficient, as it were, but. These are all normal variants, <coughs> and there is that is no separation. That's just how the labour actually attaches. Um, the biceps can be abnormal as well. So this, if you look at this biceps, this is the biceps here, and if you look, it's actually got a membrane attaching itself to the to the capsule. So this is called a vincular biceps. Um, this is a normal variant. I must say, actually, I think in this individual, I ended up tenotomizing the biceps because I think it was causing a problem for them. They've got the cord-like middle bleeding or ligament, that's the subscapularis. The extra articular portion of biceps is normal here. Um, you can have a bifid, bifid biceps. I have never seen any of you guys seen a bifid biceps? So it's one part of it is attached sort of like that vincular and the other part is attached to <coughs> the glenoid labrum, that's pretty rare. Complete absence, I must admit, I've seen that a couple of times. You sort of wonder whether it's because their biceps actually previously were actually there. Now um, the superior labral attachment, eight out of ten times will be firmly attached like on that video and on that picture. And then and anywhere between 15% and half the time, it's reasonably mobile. But when you put your probe in and you put it underneath the superior labral attachment, 
there is no exposed bone. It's just cartilage that continues over the top of the glenoid uh, superior bicipital tuberosity. Uh, and then 6% <coughs> of the time there's this thing called the Buford complex. Okay, so um, sublabel foramen, anywhere between 12 o'clock and 3 o'clock, there may be a hole. It sort of looks like a Bangkok tear, but it's not. And if you read an <coughs> MRI report where the radiologist has gone, there is a superior labral tear at 2 o'clock on the clock face, it's bullshit because you, it's not a tear, it's just <coughs> something that's normal. So don't go and repair it. Um, and if you repair it, you might make their middle glenial humeral ligament tight and then you give them a frozen shoulder. Um, so anything between 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock should be lovely. <coughs> anything below the equator that is separated is a Bangkok tear. And the Buford complex <coughs> is this sort of situation here, the video's not running, um, where the, and the, the, the middle glenial ligament becomes the labrum. And actually, what happens is the labrum actually starts at about the equator and then continues down. So there is this sort of absence of labral tissue between 12 and 3 o'clock. Okay? Um, <clears throat> just like that, do you see that? So long head biceps is here, middle bleeding humeral ligament, which is cord like but becomes the labrum and continues down. Um, and then the labrum does not actually start until 3 o'clock, so that's entirely normal. And then the middle bleeding humeral ligament, there's lots of variability. You can have, uh, sorry, superior bleeding humeral ligament, there's variability. <coughs> Um, the middle vein humeral ligament, there is either a veil, a cord, um, or it can be folded, and then uh, anterior labrum is generally attached from 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock all the time. Bare area, which you pointed out earlier, if it's very big and it extends medially, it may represent what? in the presence of instability. It all sounds exactly that. There is the rotator ridge, which is this crescent-like uh, <coughs> cable that goes across the superior aspect of supraspinatus, um, which is a normal variant, so it does not represent a tear. And uh, like I said, the thing that will <coughs> differentiate this between that and a partial articulate surface tear is the fact that actually if you look the tissue is attached to the origin of where the cartilage is within one millimeter. So there's no bare tuberosity there. Okay? There's normally a cleft at the back. Um, <coughs> what else? I think that's all you need to know. Does that all make sense? So that's normal. So <coughs> what we're going to do is now we're going to find out about some other <coughs> things.